Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Alan Mattiso. I'm an associate director of the Baker Institute, and I'm very pleased to welcome everybody tonight to our event. We've been in business here for 23 years. We've we've had um, heads of state, we've had prime ministers, we've had diplomats. We, we've had people who who make history here, but probably. None of them has helped more people around the world than our speaker tonight, who is Dr. Peter Hotez. Dr. Hotez is um, an internationally renowned authority on global health. He got a Bachelor of Arts from Yale in, um, I guess a Bachelor of Science from Yale, in molecular uh, biology in, in uh, 1980 got a PhD in um, um, biochemistry from uh, Rockefeller University in 86 and an MD in uh, 87. Uh, he's held faculty positions and positions of leadership at Yale and at um, George Washington University. In 2011, he moved his group of 15 to uh, the College uh, Baylor College of Medicine and was the first dean of the the National School of Tropical Medicine. And he was also the president of, um, I guess what you would describe as his research arm, uh, the Sabin Vaccine Institute. Um, the, uh, that institute is, is, um, develops vaccines uh, for the treatment of uh, diseases among the poor, which is to say the kind of diseases that uh, big pharmaceutical companies aren't particularly interested in. Um, along the way, Dr. Hotez uh, published more than 400 articles, a book on uh, neglected tropical diseases. Uh, he um, has raised millions for his research. Uh, he advises governments, testifies before Congress, and in 2014, the White House and the State Department arranged for his appointment as science envoy. And as I understand it, Dr. Hotez, you spent a lot of that time developing uh, diplomatic collaborations with uh, Middle Eastern and, and North African governments. Um, he's here tonight because he has recently published a book, which is up there on the screen, Blue Marble Health an innovative plan to fight diseases of the poor amid wealth. Um, blue marble is a phrase I'd, I never heard, but I learned about it from reading the book. Uh, the origins of this are in photographs taken by astronauts on Apollo 17 uh, in 1972, photographs of the Earth. And from a distance of 25,000 miles, what you see is a sphere that suggests the color of blue marble. And at that distance, you don't see borders between nations. You don't see racial differences. There are no rich and poor. All you see is a blue marble goal, go, um, a globe. And that symbol, that blue marble has come to stand for um, peace and healing. And so that's the origin of the title uh, of this book. There's a lot of really interesting stuff in this book. I'll just mention one, one um, group of facts at the beginning, which I found totally fascinating. We're used to governments that don't function. We're used to policies that fail. That's, that's where we live. This book tells a story of a tremendous success, and that is um, the UN Millennial, Millennial Development Goals established in 2000. Uh, there were eight of them. Uh, goal number four was uh, to reduce child mortality. Goal number six was to combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. Uh, and this book describes how governments get together, mobilize resources, and have a plan. Uh, and the plan in this case 
was to disseminate vaccines, old vaccines, new vaccines, among the bottom billion, among the most extreme um, communities of poverty. And here was the result. At the end of the 15-year period for this goal, uh, child mortality was reduced by 50%. This is an incredible achievement, and there were similar uh, achievements in um, combating um, AIDS and malaria. But there were these other diseases, which uh, Dr. Hotez calls uh, neglected diseases. They're neglected because governments don't pay attention to them, researchers and funders don't pay attention to them, they afflict the poorest people, uh, and so the rest of society does not pay attention to them, uh, and they are, um, uh, especially uh, diseases in which he, Dr. Hotez is interested in, uh, which are, are tropical diseases. And um, what he has done in uh, studying this subject is to redraw the map of disease, because it turns out that the location of these neglected tropical diseases is not Africa. It's the 20 most wealthy countries in the world. And within those countries, it is a third world islands of poverty that suffer these diseases. That is, in, um, amid this affluence, uh, we have these neglected tropical diseases. In, this, in the American South, in Texas, you go down the street to the third ward, uh, the fifth ward, and you will, you will see uh, what he's, he's writing about. Um, so, the subject of this book is um, the extent of this problem, the consequences of this problem, and how to solve this problem. Uh, and if you want to uh, 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 read, read the book, we make it easy for you. You can buy this book out in the foyer, and Dr. Hotez will be out in the Dory Commons, and if anybody wants to have him sign the book, um, they can do that, he can do that. Uh, and I might mention that, so far as I know, this is the only book ever written whose forward was written by Cher, right here. Um, I'd just like to say one other thing about Dr. Hotez. He's a fellow at the Baker Institute, and as busy as he is, and I know no one in the world who's as busy as Dr. Hotez, he spends a lot of time um, developing his programs uh, at the Baker Institute. We have uh, something we do every spring. We give a course for undergraduates on um, introduction of public policy. And the fellows uh, of the Institute lecture in the course, teach the course. And uh, for about three years, four years, Dr. Hotez, Dr. Hotez has, has taught in that course, teaches it, yeah, gives a lecture. Couldn't do it this year because he was called to Washington, but he's done it in past years. And when he goes into that course, and he tells them what he does, and he describes the problem, and he models for them what a passionate and devoted person can accomplish in the world. He teaches them something that ne they'll never forget, which is the ability of a dedicated individual to change the world. And what you hear from that stu those students when they leave is they are inspired by that. And there's a lot to talk about when you talk about Dr. Hotez, but that is no small achievement in itself. So will you please welcome to our podium, Dr. Peter Hotez. Well, uh, Alan, thank you for that uh, generous introduction. I'm almost inclined, I'm thinking of my father who passed away a couple of years ago who always advised me quit while you're ahead and I, I feel like I should just shut up now and, <laughs> and just go, go sign the book. You said it beautifully. Uh, you gave a great summary. In fact, I think I'd like to bring you on the road with me. I think you did a better job than, than I would. It's very nice of you to uh, uh, come out this evening on this uh, beautiful night. And I'll just talk for about 20, 25 minutes and kind of give you an overview of uh, what the book's about. I just want to acknowledge some special guests. My longtime associate, Dr. Mary Elena Batazzi, is here, uh, who, who's a partner in all these crimes uh, that you're going to hear about 
uh, tonight. And uh, it's unusual for my wife, Ann, to come to these things. So uh, wave your hand, Ann. So she's so, uh, who's, uh, who's put up with this for 30 years. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about tonight is uh, uh, what I consider is a paradigm shift in, in what's happening with uh, the world's poverty-related diseases and global health. And uh, as Alan mentioned, uh, we're going to start out talking about these very interesting Millennium Development Goals. So what I want to do is quickly kind of go th through lightning speed, take you through the last 15 years of success in global health because that's the length of the Millennium Development Goals what we've achieved, but now where we're falling behind because it's like peeling away the layers of an onion. Uh, we've uncovered one layer, solved a problem, but now we've uh, also identified a new set of problems uh, that are currently happening. So we'll start with these Millennium Development Goals. How many people have heard of the MDGs? So it's, you know, I'm, all, I'm not a big fan of the United Nations documents. I think most of them are forgotten about as quickly as they're drafted. But this one has really stuck. And it's had an enormous amount of advocacy. It was launched in 2000 by Kofi Annan, who was Secretary General of the United Nations then. And uh, it, we, back then in 2000, he brought all global leaders to United Nations headquarters to say, we've got to do something about the plight of the bottom billion, the billion people in the world who live on nothing. And these were very forward-looking goals. They talked in broad strokes. And one of the big important differences, I don't know if this is a pointer, is that it, um, I don't know if there's another, oh, here's another pointer here, that it, it also, linked poverty to disease, and the idea being that disease both occurs in the setting of poverty and causes poverty. And there were uh, two major uh, goals related to disease, reduce child mortality, combat AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, and improve maternal health. And this was important because it generated a lot of momentum. All global leaders got behind it. Tony Blair got behind it. George W. Bush got behind it. Um, it then it also, in addition to Kofi Annan, it involved the celebrity community. This is when Bono first got involved in talking about global health. And it brought in, uh, Brad Pitt did a four-part series on uh, on the Millennium Development Goals for public television. And if you get Brad back then, not so much now, you got, you got Angelina also. And then <laughs> so this created a lot of uh, uh, ex excitement. Uh, Bill Gates, this is when Bill Gates started the Gates Foundation. And uh, I want to talk about, start out talking about the progress in two of those goals. And that's how I start out the book. So let's look at this one, Reduce Child Mortality. And the, uh, the major event that happened there was a new organization was created. And it, was, it came, became known as Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. And now they just abbreviated as Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. And the idea was we're not, we were back in before 2000, we weren't doing as good a job as we could have in terms of getting kids vaccinated, getting them their diphtheria vaccine, pertussis vaccine, tetanus. Uh, you name it, polio, haemophilus influenza type B, uh, and uh, measles, mumps, rubella. And the idea was to accelerate that global coverage and also introduce two new vaccines that weren't online back then for rotavirus and pneumococcal disease. Uh, the picture I'm using to illustrate this is an interesting one. It's a Brazilian artist by the name of Salgado. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he's, he, one of the uh, sets of photographs he's done is he spent a year going all around the world watching kids get their vaccinations. And uh, it's a very powerful set of photographs, uh, mostly because of the expression on the parents' faces, which uh, has, has the full spectrum of human emotions from fear, anxiety, to hope, to joy, to, to optimism, to uh, you name it. And I like this one here because the dog seems to be really sympathizing with the kid uh, uh, over here. And this is, of course, the child getting their polio vaccine. So uh, what's so, and this Gavi Alliance was launched right after the Millennium Development Goals and Bill and Melinda Gates put up $750 million uh, to get it started. And I think uh, it's, it's an incredible successful program and now we're in a position to evaluate it and that's because one of the things Bill Gates did at the same time was to create uh, a new a new organization called the Global Burden of Disease Study based at an institute in Seattle called the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation to really evaluate did this stuff work 
And now the papers to evaluate the Millennium Development Goals are coming out as a series of articles in the Lancet, mostly in the Lancet, the British Journal of the Lancet. And this is what one of these papers looks like. It's an enormous undertaking with hundreds of investigators. It looks like a paper coming out of the CERN Physics Laboratory. And um, to really evaluate what's been the impact uh, of all this. I'm actually here somewhere. It's like, where's Waldo? Here, here I am over here. It's just an enormous undertaking. And so I'm, I'm going to get to the punchline. The punchline is, is a pretty, as, as Alan mentioned, a pretty impressive uh, number uh, where we're seeing a massive reduction in measles deaths, tetanus deaths, diphtheria, pertussis, haemophilus influenza type B deaths. Uh, the two new vaccines that were introduced, 36% uh, reduction in deaths from pneumococcal disease, rotavirus. And the idea is we went from 12, 12 million dying in 1990 every year to 4 million. So it's still a lot, but a massive reduction, 2.5 million childhood lives uh, saved uh, every year. <coughs> so this is a slam dunk victory. And this, these kinds of numbers are important because the Gates Foundation can't fund everything. We need the G7 countries to support this. So every year, uh, the head of Gavi goes to the U.S. Congress to get funds replenished, and, and, and they've got, there's a lot of bipartisan support, but they want to see that the U.S. taxpayer money is going for something useful, as well as the U.K. and the other G7 countries. And this is a, a clear-cut uh, victory. Now, there is a country where we've not done as well, uh, where we're actually, we actually think we're reversing Millennium Development Goals. And it's sort of a what am I thinking question. Anybody want to guess? The US. The US, yeah. So what happened was around this time, the California legislature allowed, uh, allowed non-medical exemption for uh, vaccines. And this coincided beginning in 1998 uh, with the rise of the anti-vaccine movement, because some people call the anti-vaxxer movement, although my wife doesn't like me using that term. She says it's too pejorative and judgmental, but mm -hmm. so sometimes I forget. But um, so the, the rise of this anti-vaccine movement where it was erroneously alleged that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine was causing uh, autism. And this caused the California, uh, uh, this, this, this created a loophole in the California legislature that allowed parents to opt their kids out of getting vaccinated uh, against, uh, against uh, a number of childhood infections. And then, not surprisingly, California started experiencing measles outbreaks, including, including ones linked to what's called SSPE, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is a very severe neurologic complication of uh, measles. And then there were two large outbreaks in 2015, uh, one in Marin County, one in Orange County. And California, the legislature looked at this and said, oh my God, we've created a monster. And they closed the loophole. And vaccine coverage rates went, went up, and, and that solved the problem. Uh, the, the problem that wasn't solved, though, was that everybody moved to Texas. <laughs> and, um, and Texas has become now the, the home of uh, the anti-vaccine uh, movement. Uh, the author of the paper in The Lancet, uh, back in 1998 that was ultimately retracted. Andrew Wakefield moved to Austin, Texas, where he's now directing a s very slick Hollywood-style documentary called Vax that alleges links between vaccines and autism, uh, and also alleges a vast conspiracy at the CDC uh, that there's a cover-up. And that coincided with the creation of a new organization called Texans for Vaccine Choice. Um, which is a political action, a self-described political action committee that uh, is uh, lobbying the state legislature and holding rallies and, and things like that. And so what we've seen now is this, this started in 2003, and now we're up to about 50,000 kids in the state of Texas whose uh, parents are opting them out of getting uh, uh, vaccinated. And it's not happening homogeneously. What's happening, it's, it's focusing in certain areas. So the Travis County, Austin area, Denton County uh, seem to be the, 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 the major areas where this is happening. So we've got private schools in Austin now where up to 40% of kids are, uh, are not, not being vaccinated, like at the Austin uh, Waldorf School. So I've written about this now and have said that uh, I predict, just like in California, we're going to start seeing measles epidemics. Measles tends to be the canary in the coal mine of infectious diseases. When vaccine coverage rates goes down, uh, that's when you start seeing. And, and I've got involved in an interesting way uh, because 
not only do I make vaccines uh, for a living for neglected tropical diseases, diseases of poverty, uh, uh, Anne and I are also autism parents. Our youngest daughter, Rachel, has severe autism and other uh, profound mental disabilities. And so what I've been doing now is assembling the literature showing not only that there is no link between vaccines and autism, I tend to take it a step further and say there's no plausibility that uh, we have now an abundance of evidence showing the genetic and epigenetic basis of autism and the, and the papers like this from Eric Korchesny's group at UCSD showing that the changes in the brains of kids with autism uh, start uh, in the first or second trimester of pregnancy well before they ever see vaccines. And it's been a, it's been a, in a hard, it's been a t tough argument uh, to, to get the anti-vaccine uh, community to, to accept. And right now there's a war going on in the Texas legislature this year uh, in terms of the anti-vaccine groups, which are very powerful and very well organized, are now trying to introduce legislation to keep that, uh, those exemptions uh, climbing, climbing even higher. So, and now what we're seeing is the possibility of a national anti-vaccine uh, movement happening. Um, we've had RFK Jr. Uh, hold a press conference and he doesn't allege the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine causes autism. In his case, it's he alleges thimerosal is associated with uh, autism and has organized a march on Washington that happened uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I'm worried that this thing is going national now and could become international as well. And the big worry, of course, is if this anti-vaccine movement starts hitting the big low and middle income countries, India, China, Brazil, Indonesia, et cetera, that we're gonna see a reverse of Millennium Development Goals number four, and so that's why I'm being so active about it. So I actually, I'm about to sign a contract with Johns Hopkins Press for my next book, uh, which tentatively is titled Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, and so it's gonna be a very personal perspective uh, on that. So that's Millennium Development Goal number four. Millennium Development Goal number six, to combat AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. Here we don't have vaccines available, so what we're doing is we're putting, uh, uh, using mass drug administration, putting people in sub-Saharan Africa on anti and retroviral drugs. So a good lot, there's a lot of that activity happening here at Baylor through the Baylor International Pediatric AIDS Initiative that was set up uh, by Mark Klein, who's now treated more than 300,000 uh, children uh, for their HIV AIDS, and a lot of that is coming through PEPFAR funds, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief uh, for malaria as well. Uh, and this is what the, the new capstone paper looks like on the evaluation here. This is only half the author list now. So it goes all the way down here. And Waldo is somewhere. Uh, got to take my where I am. Uh, and, and, and there the numbers are not as dramatic as they are for vaccines, uh, but they're still impressive. 19 million lives saved from HIV AIDS, 30% uh, reduction in malaria. So making a big impact. Now, that's the good news. No, but there's the, the thing that, uh, that I don't like about Millennium Development Goal number six was, well, let's read it. Combat AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. What do you see wrong with that Millennium Development Goal? Let's look at branding purposes. Combat AIDS, everybody gets that. Combat malaria, what's that? Yeah, I mean, you, you could combat something indefinitely. Well, well, the problem was, I don't know what they were thinking. Somebody came up with this term, other diseases which was an absolute disaster from an advocacy uh, point of view, right? You're not seeing Brangelina standing up there saying, other diseases, right? So, so and the, those of us who were working on other diseases realized we were on the outside looking in on all these Millennium Development Goals. So um, we, uh, a couple of us got together, myself, uh, David Molyneux, who is my counterpart in Liverpool, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, Alan Fennick at Imperial College London, actually went and did a branding exercise. We, we made up this term called neglected uh, tropical diseases and identified this group of a dozen chronic parasitic infections that are highly debilitating and often stigmatizing and poverty promoting. Uh, because of their long-term impact on child development, worker productivity, pregnancy outcome. I'll show you the list in a minute. And this is, and I, I wrote my first single author book 
uh, on this called Forgotten People or Forgotten Diseases. And you can imagine what my kids would call that. They would call it Dad's Forgotten Book on Forgotten People with Forgotten Diseases. <laughs> but but, but you know, now it's in its second edition. It got translated into Japanese. And here's the list. Um, and I call them the most important diseases you've never heard of. Uh, uh, they include intestinal worm infections like ascariasis and trichuriasis. Um, Dengue, lymphatic filariasis, onchocerciasis, Chagas disease, Leishmaniasis, now Ebola and Zika have been added to the list. But the point is, I, I don't focus on the details, just look at the fact that the numbers are extraordinary. Basically, every single person living in poverty has at least one of these uh, afflictions. And, and this is an example of one of them, lymphatic filariasis, which affects uh, 38 million people. Uh, a lot of these are not killer diseases. This individual says, it's quite a problem for me when I have to stand to work for long periods. So he's too sick to go to work, too sick to provide for his family. These are very stigmatizing diseases, especially for girls and women who are rendered unmarriageable or grounds for spousal abandonment. Uh, here's another one of these neglected tropical diseases, female genital schistosomiasis. Uh, this is a disease of 250 million people, and we estimate now there's about 100 million girls and women living in poverty in Africa who have this condition. It's caused by a worm that lives in the blood vessels that deposits eggs that get into the, into the cervix, uterus, and lower genital tract. It's cause of bleeding and pain and stigma, and now it's also been linked to a three to four-fold increase in, Af uh, in HIV AIDS. So I think it's one of the most, Africa's most important cofactors in its uh, AIDS epidemic, and no one's ever ever heard of it. Uh, so it's probably Africa's most common gynecologic condition. So what do we do about it? Well, we're doing a lot of research and development in our labs to make vaccines for these conditions. But uh, prior to that, we said, could we do more to raise awareness about these diseases and uh, use existing medicines that we have on the shelf and put them together in a package. And a lot of these were donated by the major pharmaceutical companies. So we wrote these back-to-back -back papers in 2005 in the Public Library of Science. But then what? I mean, the problem was we didn't have Brangelina and, and anybody else taking on neglected tropical disease. Actually, I'd, I'd met Brad Pitt at the Clinton Global Initiative talked about these diseases. It turns out Brad Pitt's a really nice man. Um, but he, he's already busy with other stuff, so I couldn't get him involved in that. So what do you do? Well, we, as scientists, we had to do it ourselves. And this, is, I think, is a very important lesson uh, for young people. And I talked to the medical students this morning. You know, you have a very powerful voice if you choose to exercise it. It's just that it's not in the DNA of scientists and physicians to be advocates. But if you're willing to take the time, you can make a big impact. So back then, th at this point, I was chairman of microbiology at George Washington University, not far from the White House and the congressional office buildings. And I would go down there and, one, try not to get arrested, and second, uh, go there and with the idea of uh, explaining to people the opportunity. and. Partly was, I was serendipity because the Bush administration had just launched PEPFAR and they were looking, and they were so happy with the results that they were looking for another big picture uh, global health initiative. And we were able to mobilize funds now that have treated uh, almost a billion people uh, with neglected uh, tropical disease for their, for the, with this package of medicines uh, that, that we've uh, developed. So where are we at? Well. This is, that takes us up to 2015, and we've, we've now done a good job at knocking down uh, AIDS to some extent, malaria, of certain neglected tropical diseases, and childhood diseases. But the reason I wrote the book is because out popped something else that it turns out, I think we've been playing this game of uh, whack-a-mole, a global health version of whack-a-mole, you know, the arcade game where you knock something down and the other one pops up. So what I want to tell you about tonight is the rise of these new group of neglected tropical diseases which are transmitted either by uh, uh, vectors, arthropods or snails, or zoonotic uh, neglected uh, tropical uh, diseases. And to explain that, uh, let me give you a couple of examples. So one of the things that we've seen now 
over the last uh, over the last few years is this sharp uptick in the number of cases of dengue fever or chikungunya virus infection, which uh, arrived in the island of St. Martin in 2013, and now it's infected most of uh, Latin America. Now we've had our first case in Texas. And of course, Zika virus infection, which exploded in Brazil in 2015, and now it's in Venezuela and, uh, and moving into uh, the United States as well. It turns out that this is not unique to the Western Hemisphere. The same thing is happening now in Southern Europe where we've seen the return of malaria to Greece after it's been gone for 70 years. Chikungunya, dengue, West Nile virus in Portugal, South France, Italy, and Spain. Schistosomiasis, which is the ultimate neglected tropical disease now on the island of Corsica, and Opus thoracus infection, liver fluke infection in Italy. So the question is, what's going on? Why are we seeing this rise in neglected tropical diseases transmitted by either insects, arthropods, or, or snails. Any idea? Climate change. So, so if you talk to the climate change people, they'll tell you next to the Arctic, the next shoe that's going to fall is southern Europe, and our, the Gulf Coast region is highly vulnerable. But that's not the only thing going on. What else is going on? What's that? Human migration. So people fleeing the conflict zones, coming across the Mediterranean, uh, maybe introducing disease, as well as Houston, places like Houston, and, uh, which is such a gateway hub. But what else is going on? Yeah. I emailed you an article from a veterinarian in Florida about toxoplasmosis mm -hmm. and people eating, the homeless people eating the cats and getting toxoplasmosis. So poverty. Poverty. So, it's so not just poverty. Uh -huh. It's that more and more cities are adopting the trap, neuter, reabandonment of cats, who are the only vector for toxoplasmosis, and they're telling you that they have vaccinated the cats, but they don't tell you that that's useless because the cat needs a second booster. Well, all I can tell you, in the poor neighborhoods in Houston, you can see stray dogs, stray cats, yeah. uh, all over. And, so, and so the city is turning them loose. So that's so poverty. So we have all these factors. So what is it? Is it is it the climate change? Is it poverty? Is it uh, human migrations? Which one is it? What's that? It's the combination of all. Of them. Intuitively, you might think it's the combination. The real answer is we have absolutely no clue. <laughs> and, and the reason we have absolutely no clue is is because is is because um, both the government agencies as well as the academic world is very siloed. Right? Nobody talks to each other. The, the virologists don't talk to the economists, don't talk to the political scientists, don't talk to the earth scientists who are doing climate change. Everybody's in their own alley, and we have no mechanism for figuring out how to sort problems. So one of the things that we look at in the book is, is, is this concept here, um, which is a, a term that's been kind of kicked around now in college circles like Rice, and it's called the Anthropocene. And uh, the Anthropocene is this, so the idea is if you look at the big geological epochs, the Pliocene, the Pleistocene, now since we've been living in the, uh, the Holocene that began at the end of the Ice Age, the idea is humans have so profoundly altered the environment that we've now inadvertently bought ourselves our own uh, geological epoch, which refers to an epoch that begins when human activities started to have a significant global impact on Earth's geology and ecosystem. So one of the things we do in the book is to really look at these modern forces that may be responsible for the rise of vector-borne neglected disease and zoonotic neglected diseases, and includes urbanization and human migrations, climate change, conflict, and politically destabilization and deforestation, and of course poverty is still dominant. So let's look at a couple of those forces. The first, the, the, a major focus of the book that, that Alan mentioned was the changing nature of, of poverty and this concept that I call blue marble health. And this is probably the most uh, provocative picture from the book. It attempts to draw a new map of global health and says the following, you know, and maybe because of the uh, impact of the Millennium Development Goals and poverty reduction, we've so profoundly changed the nature of poverty that we've seen a shift. What we're seeing is a rise of all economies globally that's leaving behind 
a bottom segment of society. And we, we looked at World Health Organization data and global burden of disease data. It came up pretty convergent. This shows the comparison between WHO data and global burden of disease data from the Institute for Health Metrics. And it's almost spot on, except for visceral leishmaniasis. What it says is that most of the world's poverty-related diseases are not necessarily in the poorest, most devastated countries of sub-Saharan Africa. They're actually among the poor living in the G20 countries. So the G20 economies are responsible for most of the world's poverty-related disease. And they say, how can that be if they're poverty-related diseases? It's because it's the poor living among the wealthy. So what we do is we identify the new hot spots in the G20 economy with a little bit of a fudge factor of Nigeria. So Nigeria is not a G20 country, but it's got an economy greater than the four bottom uh, G20 countries. And when you look at all of that, these are the hot spots where we're seeing significant levels of uh, neglected tropical diseases. So let me give you a couple of quick examples. So if we look at Chagas disease, which is a disease that we're working on a lot uh, in our laboratory, uh, what we find is that most of the world, and this is a parasitic infection of the heart that's transmitted by kissing bugs, and it's a disease of the poorest of the, of the poor. And what we find now is most of the cases of Chagas disease today are in Latin America's three largest economies. Uh, Argentina, Brazil, and uh, Mexico. And again, it's the poor are living in those countries. And, and, and these are the numbers of people affected. These are not small numbers, right? More than three million people live with Chagas disease in Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico. 99% do not have access to diagnosis and treatment. So a big part of this is to say, that it's not a resource problem, it's an awareness problem and an allocation problem, making the leaders of the G20 countries aware of their level of suffering uh, within their own country. Let me give you another example, northeastern Brazil. So Brazil's the largest economy in Latin America. Uh, but when you go into northeastern Brazil, it's a pocket of intense poverty and disease. It's where you find Brazil schistosomiasis and leishmaniasis, Chagas disease and dengue. And what else did we see arise out of northeastern Brazil in 2015? Yeah, that's where Zika, uh, that's where all the microcephaly cases we started seeing in 2015. And my point of the book is to say, it's not by coincidence, it's the same place where all of, uh, all of Brazil's other neglected tropical diseases are. And so most of, the, uh, most of the cases of Zika and microcephaly are in two major cities, uh, Salvador de Bahia uh, and, um, uh, and Recife. So let's look at what those cities look like. So let's see, what screams Zika at you when you look at those uh, cities? So first of all, Zika is a uh, virus that's transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquito. It's a mosquito that's specially adapted to uh, humans. Uh, that, uh, so crowding, it loves to go bite person to person. Let's see, do we see any crowding here? <laughs> Maybe a little, huh? It's uh, Salvador de Bahia. What else does it love? Uh, what, else, what else do you see here? Water, right? Uh, look, at the, look at the level of housing, right? Uh, so no air conditioning, no window screens, so all of these factors. We don't really know why we have that association between poverty and, and Zika or as well as the other neglected tropical disease, but the, uh, disease, but the association is very strong. So Zika now has been climbing up into uh, Venezuela. What's happening in Venezuela right now? What's happening to the economy of Venezuela? Yeah, everyone's going like this, right? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's collapsing. And with it, what are we seeing? We're seeing not only uh, widespread Zika virus infection, but we're seeing the uh, uptick of Chagas disease, the return of schistosomiasis, new recrudescence in malaria, dengue, uh, because of the, the destabilization there. And then it's going into Colombia. Honduras is getting hit very hard in Mexico. And then what's going on here? So do we have poor people in the state of Texas? Do we have poverty? Well, the Center, Centers for Disease Control said no, right? When, when Zika threatened the, when I was saying Zika was threatening the U.S. at the end of 2015, beginning of 2016, the leadership of Health and Human Services uh, got up and said, don't worry about Zika, everybody's wealthy, everybody has air conditioning, um, so we're not, it's not going to be a problem. And so let's look at Texas. So we, uh, throughout uh, 
the, the winter this year. We've had cases in uh, Brownsville in South Texas many of them associated with the Colonias in, in South Texas. What screams Zika at you here? What, what does Aedes aegypti like more than anything else on the planet? Tires, right. And, and the problem is that uh, it's been, not only has there been transmission during the winter uh, of 2016, but what's this winter been like in terms of climate? Yeah, it's been one of the mildest winters, warmest winters around, right? It's, I mean, we, we had a cold day a couple of days ago, and somebody said that was the coldest day we had all winter, and that was in, that was in the spring. Uh, so, and what do you see if you go uh, just a few miles? Let's go up to up 59 to the Lions Avenue exit, and this is what you see. You see houses with no window screens, uh, dumped, discarded tires. And so this is a new paper we have coming out, The Rise of Neglected Tropical Diseases in Texas. Again, the poor living among the wealthy. Uh, and um, so we've now got this paper coming out where we estimate around 3 million Texans live with a neglected tropical disease. Uh, around 5 million Texans live below the poverty line. Now, uh, poverty is not the only factor. Uh, from the book, I estimate that the next biggest factor responsible for the rise of these new neglected tropical diseases is uh, conflict and political destabilization. And I make the case, why did Ebola arise out of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone in 2014, 2013, 2014? It wasn't because it was tropical, maybe that was a factor, but the health system had collapsed because of decades of atrocities in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. There was widespread deforestation as people were trying to eke out a living uh, and cutting down forests, coming into contacts with bats. So that's a major factor. And saying, okay, if that's true, where else in the world now do we have a, a similar level of atrocities and conflict? So, and look what we're seeing. Now, we actually can't get into Syria, right, or to really evaluate, but we're getting glimpses of disease from refugees spilling across uh, into refugee camps, into, uh, into Jordan, into Lebanon, into Egypt, into Turkey, and this is what we're seeing. We're, we're seeing the return of measles and polio. We're also uh, seeing a big uptick in this disease called Leishmaniasis, which I'll tell you about a little bit more. It's a parasitic infection. Uh, return of Schistosomiasis in Yemen. The other thing that's happening is animals are being trafficked uh, uh, because there's no international borders anymore. So we're seeing zoonotic diseases from animals, brucellosis, uh, MERS uh, coronavirus. This is uh, the one that we're seeing, one of the biggest upticks, and now um, Mary Lane and I just got some funding from the Department of Defense to make a vaccine for this disease. Uh, the locals call it Aleppo evil. It's not a killer disease, but it's highly disfiguring. It's transmitted by sand flies, and it injects a parasite known as a leishmania parasite that causes this horrific ulcerative disease. And again, if little girls get this, they're scarred for life, they're rendered unmarriageable. It always hits girls and women uh, the hardest. And so it's the combination of poverty, uh, with conflict that are uh, this incredible forces. So the question then is, what do we do about this, these, the rise of these new diseases? And uh, I think is one of the approaches is going to be bringing in the economists, the political scientists. These are complex problems. We're going to need to address climate change. But one of the things that we're trying to do here in Houston is carve out one piece of that in making vaccines. And the problem that we have with making vaccines, diseases, va vaccines for these diseases was best articulated by David Letterman, who said the following, uh, Pepsi has a new Doritos flavored Mountain Dew. No, we don't have an Ebola vaccine, but we do have a Doritos flavored Mountain Dew. So what, what did he mean by that? Well, what happened with Ebola? The technology to make the Ebola vaccine was actually uh, first developed in, uh, uh, in 2003. The publication of the Ebola vaccine was in, came out in Nature magazine from Gary Nabel's group at the NIH in 2003. Not th 2013, 2003. And what happened was the technology sat there. And why did it, sat, why did it sit there? Yeah, somebody's going like this, money, right? Because what's the, what's the paradigm? The paradigm is 
you develop something in an academic lab, you license it to one of the big pharmaceutical companies, the big pharmaceutical companies then uh, turn it into a bottle of vaccine for clinical trials and ultimately licensure. But GlaxoSmithKline, Merck, Pfizer, Novartis, they weren't they weren't interested. Why? Because of the lack of financial incentive. So the, uh, finally what happened and around by the 2014, the Obama administration realized we've got a problem on our hands. We really need an Ebola vaccine. And through the US government, through an organization called BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research Development Authority, they put up $100 million. And guess what? Merck, GlaxoSmithKline, and Crucell came in and turned it into, licensed it, turned it into a bottle of Ebola vaccine, started clinical testing, and what happened? Ebola was gone, right? Because the, the, we brought in the U.S. military, they cleaned things up, and we stopped transmission. Uh, so the vaccine never got fully tested. It showed preliminary results showing that it looks like it's very exciting and 11,000 people perished who didn't have to because they didn't have the vaccine in time. So we've got, uh, and this is why I often come to places like Rice University, I said I can make all the great, we can make all the greatest vaccines in the world, but the problem is we don't have the financial innovation. We don't have smart people from business schools and law schools and the social sciences helping us figure out how to actually get those vaccines uh, to the people who need them. So what we've set up at Texas Children's Hospital uh, and Baylor College of Medicine is an organization that's known as a PDP, a Product Development Partnership. Some people disparage them as guaranteed money losing companies, and I guess there's some truth to that, but these are, these, the idea is making vaccines in the nonprofit sector, and I invite you all to come visit. We're on several floors of the Feigen Center on the third, fifth, ninth, uh, uh, 14th floors of the Feigen Center of the in the Texas Medical Center, and we're, we've got a portfolio of that vaccines that we're making uh, for uh, the world's poorest people, including a new leishmaniasis vaccine, a Chagas vaccine, a schistosomiasis vaccine, and we're, we're trying to advance them. The last thing that we're doing at the same time is trying to build capacity, because one of the things that's nice about making those vaccines in the nonprofit sector is uh, we can teach people how to make vaccines. So right now, you can't come from the Middle East or North Africa or Southeast Asia or anywhere else and walk into GlaxoSmithKline or Merck or Pfizer and say, teach me how to make a vaccine. But you can do that with us. So we've now, uh, and what happened was in 2014, as Alan mentioned, I took on this role with the White House and State Department as a U.S. science envoy. And, uh, and the idea, w or my, my role there was to see whether we could use our uh, facility here in Houston for purposes of capacity building. So this was a role that uh, Obama created in 2009, he went to Cairo and talked about reaching out to the Muslim world and the sciences and the arts, and, and from that created the U.S. Science Envoy Program, and then selected me in 2014, and I focused on uh, countries that had some biotechnology capacity for making vaccines. There's some other stories around that as well in terms of what were State Department priorities. Uh, so we focused on Morocco, Tunisia, and uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, hopefully soon, when Mary Elena, we're going to have a contingent, June, a contingent of Saudi scientists then coming to our labs and we'll be taking them through each step of the vaccine development cycle. Now, um, what happened at the end of Obama's term uh, was nobody told me what happens to the U.S. Science Envoy program. Am I still U.S. Science Envoy or not? So I made the mistake of calling the White House. Believe it or not, you can call the White House. And uh, right a week before the inauguration, I said, am I still U.S. Science Envoy? And they said, uh, I don't know. We'll get back to you, Dr. Hotez. And um, uh, 36 hours later, I got a very nice letter uh, from President Obama and Secretary Kerry thanking me for my public service. So that was the answer. But I'm trying to get back in now uh, through this administration because I think the idea is still good. And I'd love to explore with you in the Q&A. Where's next outside the Middle East? Where should we be doing uh, vaccine diplomacy, uh, as I call it? So uh, I've spoken long enough, longer than I should have probably, so let's stop there and ask a few, uh, ask a few questions. Thank you. Yes. The nuts and bolts of this, say you develop a vaccine and you have it on the shelf and the plague hits. 
how long does it take to ramp up to where it's meaningful production you know you know for these things to do different vaccines have different ramp up time or they Absolutely. It depends on the technology, whether it's a recombinant protein vaccine or a live virus vaccine, and then whether it's a vaccine you actually try to stockpile or you make it on an emergency uh, use basis. Uh, the problem that we're having now is, you know, we've been able to get vaccines from discovery all the way to the early stages of clinical development, but the later stages of clinical development, advanced clinical development, advanced industrial manufacture, that requires a larger infusion of cash than we've been able to, to get. So we're now really trying to figure out the business model, the financial model of how to get all the way to the finish line for that. Yes? How big a factor with polio, for instance, trying to get some of the cultural barriers for people actually having the same taking vaccine was a real problem. Uh, is yeah, like it is in Texas. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> but speaking of the, in the, the broader world, yeah. is that a major, is the cultural yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So we, the term now that's been thrown around is this concept of vaccine hesitancy. You know, what is it that that are barriers to getting people vaccinated? So in in Texas, it's an anti-vaccine movement that's linked to a, a libertarian movement in some ways. In California, it's an anti-vaccine movement that's I don't know quite how to describe it, sort of peace, love, and granola. We have to be careful what we put into our kids. But in Pakistan and Afghanistan, right, it's linked to the Taliban and, and faux conspiracy theories that vaccines are being used to sterilize Muslim girls. So this is something that also needs to be looked at in depth. And again, this is why we need the anthropologists and the social scientists to get us to understand what the hurdles are, what the barriers are. Yes, in the back. Um, about a year and a half ago, you spoke at the World Affairs Council um, as we were becoming aware of the Zika uh, issue. And um, it seemed like we, in the U.S., dealt with that pretty well, perhaps because we'd been softened up by the Ebola awareness not that long before. Um, given the controlled environment of, of the U.S., what did we do well and where did we learn that we could uh, improve um, in, in some of these outbreaks. So thanks. Um, I think, um, where did we do well? We did well and we finally got some funds mobilized uh, from Congress, although it happened uh, when it was a little too little too late after the peak months in the summer when we have Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. So where we went wrong is the fact that we've never, we never did active surveillance actually looking for Zika virus cases. So we really don't know the full extent of Zika virus transmission on the Gulf Coast, Texas, and Florida. And as I've been saying, we're not going to fully know until nine months later, which means about now, if we start seeing microcephaly babies being born on the Gulf Coast, Florida, or Texas. So we're not, still not out of the woods from 2016. So it wouldn't surprise me if we suddenly learn that there were two cases of microcephaly coming out of Biloxi, Mississippi, or, or somewhere in New Orleans or, or in, in South Texas, because we never really did the act of surveillance. So the idea that the, that the, the infection was limited to two small areas of South Texas and South Florida, I'm, I'm not 100% convinced. And that's, pro that's one problem. The other is the fact that you know, all of our public health control is done at the state level and it and it's really done at the county level and and counties are very heterogeneous in their ability to combat infection so we're blessed here in Harris County with an amazing mosquito control division we've got actually two health departments we've got a city health department and a county uh, health department so this is a well-oiled machine for combating uh, epidemics here but you go two or three counties over and they have very few resources and very little, very little capabilities. So we still haven't fixed that problem. And that's true all along the Gulf Coast, Florida, and Texas, I think. Yes? Great talk. Thanks. Thank you. Anyway, it, I worked at a low resource environment in Tanzania, and mm -hmm. we integrated traditional healers mm -hmm. and traditional birth attendants with medicinal, medical doctors in regional health centers. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and we accomplished two things. Number one, we developed a referral network, which I think is portable to other countries because every African village has a traditional healer. Mm -hmm. And these people love getting some training. And number two, they have access to a multitude of medicinal plants. I also work with NCI, who t takes care of you know researchers right. medicinal plants right. in Washington. And I guess you're familiar with Taxol that came from the mm -hmm. Pacific U. So I think this is a whole other area of underdeveloped research that, using the model that we used in Tanzania, could produce meaningful results in the future. I think. I th thanks for that. I mean, I think in places like the U.S., we don't fully appreciate the depth and breadth of poverty here. And, um, and that, that I start out the book by taking a drive through the Fifth Ward. And it could, didn't have to be the Fifth Ward. It could have been Aldine or Sunnyside or Acres Home or in a number of other places in, in, in Texas. And, we don't, and with that, we don't have an adequate health system in place. Um, as one of my colleagues at Baylor College of Medicine says, and I won't say who it is, he says, here we are at the Texas Medical Center, the most advanced medical center in the world, and yet Houston has some of the worst health indicators of any major city. Uh, so we, we have to fix that somehow. Thanks. Yes, hi. Um, so we've seen a lot more social science research that's come out saying like the more facts you give people, so like vaccine safety facts, the more there's beliefs just cement to the contrary. So where do you think we should be pushing with the Texas anti-vax movement? Like what point should we be making? How do not just let people's beliefs to the contrary keep cementing? Yeah, I mean, this is something that I'm, I'm going to explore now in, in the new book. And in fact, this issue of Science Magazine that just came out actually it looks at some of those factors. And you're right, just throwing more facts at people is, is uh, ordinarily uh, not enough. I mean, I try to clearly make the case, first of all, the literature supports, there's, refutes any link between vaccines and autism. I try to bring in this lack of plausibility that, uh, you know, based on what we've seen with autism, that it's something that's beginning in pregnancy well before kids ever see vaccines. I still don't think uh, that's enough. So that's point one. Point two, one of the things that I've observed about the anti-vaccine community of people is they don't all speak with one voice. About 60 to 70 percent are not really dug in. They've heard something that is unsavory about vaccines or they've done a Google search and have been unlucky enough to get one of these awful websites like the Age of Autism or the National Vaccine Information Center, which is the National Vaccine Misinformation Center. But they can be you can speak to those individuals. The, the tough ones are the 10 or 20 percent of individuals who are really dug in and that they've made a part of their personal belief system and it's, I, I still haven't figured out a way to, to, to reach a lot of those individuals. So, I, so that's a long way of saying I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> Yes. Because it seemed to me that HP, like HPV vaccine, that, that was involved more politics yeah. than anything else. There was, there was a lot of politics involved. And we're still fighting it. We're still, mm -hmm. uh, and there's still a lot of people who feel that the, you know, one of the things that the anti-vaccine people use is the diseases we're fighting are not, are, are imaginary problems or made up problems. I still get emails and calls all the time telling me that I'm exaggerating measles. Measles is just a rash. They don't realize it was until, up until a few years ago, the leading killer of children in the world after we eradicated uh, smallpox. And in the pre-vaccine era in the United States, 500 children died every year and 50,000 were hospitalized with severe neurologic impairment. So part of the problem is we've been too successful. And we, people that, people, parents don't see these diseases in the community. They don't see measles, they don't see polio anymore. So that's, that's part of the problem as well. Peter, we have time for one more. One more question, yes. Uh, you started by discussing the success of the United Nations document. Um, I assume that didn't eliminate um, funding barriers. So what kind of obstacles, what are key obstacles other than funding that you think um, are blocking global partnerships and help? No, thanks for that. I think from my perspective, what we're seeing now is uh, people, you know, places like the United States and some of the G7 countries don't have the same appetite that they had previously for global health. 
So uh, I was in the Bundestag in, in, in Berlin a few weeks ago, and they made it quite clear that um, in part because of uh, Angela Merkel's policies and uh, the allowing the Syrian immigrants in and some of the things that have happened, there's been a spillover, collateral damage to wanting to support global health. So we're not going to see a big uptick in Germany. We're not going to see a big uptick from the other G7 countries. Um, probably this administration, we're not going to see a big uptick in supporting global health. So one of the points that I try to make in the book, if the problem's with the G20, maybe there's some pressure that could be exercised. Because we're not seeing, beyond the US, we're not seeing the other G20 countries step up. China's not doing enough, right? Japan's not doing enough. Russia's not doing enough. Brazil's not doing enough. And maybe there's an opportunity to get this the attention of the G20 summit. So in Hamburg, Germany, it's going to be in July. So I've written a piece for Die Zeit, uh, one of the big German uh, newspapers. And I'm having a, I'm going to talk via Skype to a group in Berlin uh, tomorrow morning, first thing. So I, I think it's might be too little too late to do this for the, the G20 summit in Germany, but the following year's in Argentina, and maybe that's where we have to put some political pressure on. That's, that's my current thinking anyway. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate it.